They made it easy. I, I'm going to have to say it, it is, sir, I don't, I don't mind the camera issue. The, the issue that I had was telling the story, remembering everything, what you do, but bringing it up, obviously talking about it. it that's difficult. I, I talk about it today all the time, but in, in, in the in the way that those answers to their questions would be helpful. So um, it did, you know, we the guys have been trying and working on this for years, as they just said. That part of the experience for me was uh, I got to meet some really great people, and to be very honest with you, with what what. What has happened to us? I didn't realize there were still good people in the world, and there are. I pretty much agree with everything Sue said. Um, I think the toughest part for me, because I was most familiar with the transcripts, legal documents, photographs, um, eyewitness reports, police reports, um, read through all the litigation. Um, which was voluminous, uh, probably were five or six hearings before the trial. The trial itself was rather large uh, in paper reading. And um, the, the toughest part for me was going through all of those things again and just constantly reliving it. And, you know, it, it, was, it was tough, particularly, but we understood why. When they needed us to do us the same interview again, so to speak, because for whatever reason, you know, the lighting might have been bad, or you know, it might have been the dogs may have barked, or something that that distracted from what they were trying to accomplish. So we go through it again, and then it, it you know, just drags it up, and it just brings it to the forefront, and it's very difficult to uh, to deal with in that regard. And there's one other thing um, regarding that. Like everybody else in any relationship, we handle things differently. Ron handles things very differently than I do. No one's right and no one's wrong. So when you have to keep talking about such a horrible thing that happened to your family, you, you tend to possibly you tend to um, not show your better self to each other. And that's, that's been difficult. Now, do you find a sense of catharsis with the completion of this film? Do you think you may not be talking about it as much besides at the present moment? No. Yeah. I, I, I so, think no. that, um, you know, one of the things that we believe uh, is that um, Zach was railroaded through a system because he was an easy pick. Um, we know the boys. We know the relationship they had. Um, we know Zach's personality, but he was in the wrong place at the wrong time with a small uh, police force that was virtually incompetent in a homicide. And uh, I mean, they, they tracked through the crime scene before they even photographed it and so forth uh, and uh, disturbed everything in there. Uh, but they, they put blinders on and they just moved forward and it just, you know, it continued. The, the newspapers were absolutely horrendous. Yeah. Um, talk about being tried in the press. I mean, from day one, Zach yeah. was just, uh, he was just yeah. a demon. I was actually referred to as the father of Satan in one of the departments. Uh, so that's, that's it's yeah. something we've had to deal with as well. And, and, and obviously, not only, I, I don't think it's any easier personally, even though Greg's been gone for 22 years, I don't find that easier, okay? I, I, every day I wonder, what would he be doing now? And the other thing is, naturally with Zach, um, I, I, I hope that we can give Zach the necessary guidance that he needs to have a a good life that he is facing he's an uphill battle and obviously none of us want to see our children have to face such a 
such a such a battle because he he is going to have one. And the other thing, sorry, honey, but um, but Jack is a is a is a bright guy, and he is. That's because he takes after me. But you know what the hell? He is he is a very bright guy, and if this wouldn't have happened to him, if Jack could have done anything, he would have been interested. Anything. I truly feel that way. And now he's going to be very restricted to um, certain, to a livelihood. He's not going to be able to do many, many things because of his record. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, that upsets me. Well, thank you. Just to, comment, just to comment very quickly on Sue's talking about 22 years, the things that you hear that are very upsetting, time heals all, uh, it was meant to be, you know, this is God's plan. All of that is nonsense Gosh. for anybody who's experienced it. Gosh. It's, it's, it doesn't go away and it doesn't get better over time. It gets worse because every day is one more day that you've been removed from your child and, uh, and, and, and one more day that you've thought about where would he be now and where would both of our boys be now. Tragedy had to set our entire path. Well, I thank you so much for your courage and your strength to be able to present this, you know, and because it's going to bring awareness to the issues. Brian Stevenson being involved um, is huge, and I'm so thankful for you to share your story. Um, and with the story being so evolving, I wanted to ask the uh, film team um, obviously, being a, an evolving story, it's constantly changing. How is that? Was it difficult to adapt? Did you, was it difficult to construct a narrative for just an hour and a half documentary? Uh, what was that experience like? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, with any documentary, when you first start, you never really know where the story is going to take you. Um, we just knew we had this heart of the story, which is Ron and Sue um, so generously sharing, you know, their innermost feelings about a tragedy that is unimaginable for anyone else besides them. Um, but beyond that, you know, when we first started, I think um, all of us kind of thought of it more as, um, you know, a little bit more focused on the crime or the legal proceedings. And we tried to find that balance over time um, in the edit with the sort of greater message about the criminal justice system. Um, but, you know, sort of as things developed, you know, we in my mind at least, I kind of thought, well, we'll be with the story forever because it's a story about a juvenile life where there's no end, sadly, to the story. Um, but because uh, Zach was able to get out on parole and because of the Supreme Court ruling, you know, we actually had an end in sight which sort of allowed us to then retroactively look back at everything and sort of see what we had amassed over those, um, for these guys, eight years. Um, yeah, I think I, I think it's I think the one thing that's so important about the um, film for me because I, I came to it, you know, with with Shannon and, and Nick and uh, Greg and, and and of course Ron and Sue telling me the story, and then I had to try to say, well, okay, now how how do we step out from the town to make this, you know, a, a, a national sort of more global sense and. In, in, and I read Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy, and had really just, uh, and, he, and interestingly enough, he had argued the case that freed Zach. And so there seemed to be a very direct connection. And then, I, then we discovered that um, not only is the United States the only country in the world that sentences its, its children to die in prison, but Pennsylvania, weirdly enough, had the largest number of uh, kids sentenced to life without parole. So then Pennsylvania became essentially the place in the world that had the largest number of, of, of children that were sentenced to die in prison. So again, it started with this little town and this, and it, and this one case, and, and, and of course, Ron and Sue and, and their family, but then it had all these implications that broadened out. And that was part of the evolution of discovering the film and discovering, you know, that larger umbrella 
that um, made it universal, I think. Yeah, there was so also a like, lot of um, game of game. Yeah, I, I was just going to say I, it, there was a lot of hope involved in this because when we began, there was no end of the film, and I don't think any sane filmmaker jumps into creating a feature-length film that has no end in sight. And it took years for these legal proceedings to inch forward, um, and a lot of it, you know, back to your question and how did it feel. Um, and how long we spent doing it it just it was it was very emotional and i think asking ron and sue to get back into that day to you know october 2nd 1998 and be in that moment was difficult and a lot of what we spent our time doing was connecting with them and really truly trying to understand the information it was as ron said voluminous it was a, a gigantic amount of information to take in um, and sifting through that was like panning for gold. So it was, um, I think there was a lot of hope that an ending would be there and that a story would be told. And um, it unfolded in front of us and we just kept following it one step behind as things evolved. And when you talk about following uh, Ron and Sue, how much time does that involve? Is it more so on some years when there's say, um, is activity going on? Is it like, is it just a week at a, a whole year? How does that work out? Yeah, we're, uh, the activity of filming it got progressively faster. Um, towards the beginning, at, at least after we finished the short film, it was, uh, that was our summary. And even then, I remember, you know, days in the edit room with three of us, Greg, myself, and Joe, thinking, and saying there's no structure here this is just pure and utter tragedy and no real end in sight um so i we, we spent a lot of time i think after that just kind of waiting we were always uh hanging out with ron and sue and and sort of keeping abreast of what the sort of legal proceedings were at the time but um towards the end i'd say the last three years and especially the last year was the busiest uh because that's when everything sort of finally shook loose um especially after the supreme court hearing then there was a, sort of an indication some little sparkle of hope um of getting zach out um so it really accelerated at that time and then there were many things happening many sort of milestone moments transpiring you know one month to the next month to the next month um, and then sort of finishing with uh, Zach getting out. That was the really the busiest time. Yeah. Um, so was it difficult to get coverage outside of your tight bond um, with the Whitman family? Because, you know, we see a little bit of uh, initial hostile feelings or out of, out of fear um, when the incident first happened. But when getting these interviews, what was that experience like? Was it difficult? Were people open to talking? Were they hesitant to revisit it? Yeah, we had quite a bit of difficulty, um, especially prior to the Supreme Court hearing and that that movement that was happening sort of on the legal side of things. We had a lot of difficulty in getting people to agree to be part of it because we were either trying to talk to integral uh, legal figures who were involved in the case when it happened and who had, a, I would say, a little bit of a vested interest in, in letting sleeping dogs lie. Um, and then, you know, it, it, it went on from there to the point where uh, I think people wanted to set their record straight or, or make sure that they had um, a clear and concise message about their their feelings and findings. Um, so it, it got easier over time. And I, I think David Peterson, just out of experience and 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 uh, accolades and everything else was able to say, hey, you might as well say something. I mean, it's really important for you to address this. Um, so we ended up getting a lot of those interviews like I said earlier, again, in the last two, three years of time when things were actually moving forward. Yeah, I think, I think um, part of it too is that 
there was a kind of gathering coalition of people once one person like Michael Barker started to participate and, and of course having Brian Stevenson also helped because you know I'd done a lot of films that dealt with civil rights and and, um, and so his he got involved largely because of, of, of that and the case itself um, but I was totally driven too by um, the sense that I wanted Ron and Sue and Zach and Greg to have a voice um, that had is, is unsung in these cases. Um, you know, you can get all the pundits you want together, but if you don't hear from the family and the suffering, uh, where there is Ron and Sue, what they first say uh, at the very beginning is if it could happen to us, it could happen to anyone. And then when you start to think uh, of all the children that don't have the advantages of a you know, middle-class family, you think about their fate in the juvenile justice system, it's, it's you know, Zach becomes a canary in the coal mine. And so that kind of argument brought other people on board as well and right to set the record straight. You're right, Nick. You know, they wanted to. I think they wanted to clarify their their view. And 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 for me, I just wanted um, to to get their voices heard too. I was I wanted to hear Michael Barker's view. I wanted to hear uh, the forensic viewpoint. I wanted to hear this sort of chorus of different voices. And so they would ping off of each other. And ultimately, I wanted us to ask the question, what responsibility do we have as a society um, uh, for our children? You know, do we just put them in prison to die there? And that, to me, is a big question that I think um, everyone was grappling with, even those in the prosecution. Yeah, and you mentioned um, making sure the different voices are heard. Now, you as a, um, kind of as sculpting this project with the rest of the team, uh, did you find it difficult to be objective at all? Or because you know you guys have been uh, so close with the Whitman family, um, was it difficult to step away when it came to like the editing process and making sure other voices were heard? Weirdly, I would to Ron and Sue's credit, I'd say they're as objective as you could possibly be given their position. Um, I can't count the number of times I've heard Ron or Sue say that if they felt or had any indication of things being different, they would want to know. Um, and I, that That's something that I think we all came to it with as well. There's this process that uh, every single person that got involved with the film had to go through wherein you first hear the circumstances and you assume, yeah, this is open and shut. Why is there any discussion? Um, and then immediately, as soon as the human factor gets added to that equation, to, to your own judgments, um, you everything sort of bleeds out into gray and uh, it's really important, I think, for that. Um, I think it's really important for people to sort of get a, an experience that's similar to that. And I think the film does that to a great extent, taking you through those levels of realization that uh, what, what is on the surface kind of uh, one thing is actually something completely different underneath. and. Uh, it was an interesting process, especially to see new people get brought on and then you have to say, well, you know, it may seem that way, but X, Y, and Z. Um, and, you know, you, you end up in the very end effects being quite confused. Uh, it's, it's tough to sort of keep your bearings straight. And uh, it's also then important to maintain that you're trying to sort of get through everything as objectively as possible, um, addressing everybody's input and, and allowing, especially people like Tim Barker, to say, well, this is why we think X, Y, and Z. Um, 
And that's actually Dude, when Barker, I, I, I said Michael Barker, I think he just hit it. No worries. Yeah. Uh, that's and a course, perfect demonstration of the sheer number of names that need to be <laughs> yeah. memorized. Um, yeah, it, it's really tough. Uh, and I think we had such great access to Ron and Sue and to all the information that they knew and to people in, on the prosecution or on the, um, on the defensive side with the almost the whole real productive process was trying to get people on the prosecution to tell us how they saw things. Um, so to that extent, I think that was, that was really the main thrust of how we were trying to stay objective in that the, the main mission goal was to say, Hey, you who thinks, uh, this, tell me why. Uh, and you get that on camera. Yeah, and for Sue and Ron, I'm sure everyone watching this right now, um, this is the documentary, the Life Doesn't Stop Where the uh, Credits Roll. Uh, I'm sure everyone wants to know if you feel like sharing. Um, how are you doing these days? What are you up to? What was your experience like seeing this film in general? Well, we haven't seen it yet. Um, so I can't comment on, on the film. I have mixed emotions about seeing it, um, to be honest with you, because the, the ending for us um, is bittersweet. Um, you know, it zaps out, and for a lot of reasons, that's great, because of coronavirus, because of Amy Barrett's uh, sitting on the Supreme Court now. There's already an article. I, I follow um, Montgomery B. Louisiana. And um, I have a Google search site on that. And there's just an article in there that they, they fully expect that all of the juvenile movement forward is going to start being rolled back. And um, I mean, even, even so far as there was one comment that they believe the death penalty is going to be reinstated for juvenile. So um, that's obviously very concerning to us for the other people that we would never want to have happen to them, what has happened to us at least for the moment, even though the sentences are too long in my opinion, there, there is a, an element of uh, light at the end of the tunnel, very long tunnel. Uh, when you talk about putting people in for 25 or 35 years uh, to, to 50 years or 35 years to life, uh, doesn't leave them a lot left, no matter how young they were when they did it. And, uh, in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania in particular, those, those are the standards. So it's, it's very rare that someone else will get out sooner than that. So, you know, they're 15, they're going to be minimum 40 or 50. They're 18, that much more. Um, so, um, yeah, it's just a concern about, about society moving forward and the impact on, uh, I mean, this will happen again. It, it probably happens more often than people know. Um, most of the time, it's probably just, you know, pretty much ignored totally. And, and the only reason that we have uh, been asked to be involved in this, it started with Jolie, who's the son of the newspaper reporter, court reporter for uh, North Daily Record, who uh, was very, very damning to Zach uh, through all of his articles for several years. And he gives me a call one day and he says, my son's been following this and he doesn't think he did it based on what he knows. And he'd like to know if he's, you know, been following this now for several years. And from being a young teenager to being ready to leave college. And, uh, you know, he would like to know if he could interview you and perhaps uh, talk to you about this project that he's working on, see if you would be willing to be involved in it or uh, to speak with him openly about what your experience is. So uh, that's, that's how we have come into vision. But that doesn't happen, I don't think, very often. Uh, but the, uh, 
the, the I think the railroading of, of of individuals, especially juveniles, who are totally incapable of protecting themselves from law enforcement, and very often law enforcement will uh, take the opportunity to interview juveniles without their parents, without their lawyers, because the kids don't know anybody. And there's kids that on multiple occasions that have finally said after 18 hours of being badgered by police, well, I don't remember doing it, but you told me I did it, I must have done it. Or, well, if you tell us you did it, we'll let you go home to your parents. And this is not seen, it's, it's not, that is not illuminated. And so people, you know, they, they go through the courts, they get thrown in jail for life. And uh, there's just, uh, it, it's, it's just a sad state of our criminal injustice system. Once again, I mean, I hope this film uh, reaches the audience that needs to see this. It is going to raise awareness. Um, Shannon, what is the future? I mean, today is the first public screening. Uh, what's the future of this film? Yeah, so um, uh, Discovery uh, purchased the film as an acquisition. So it is uh, premiering on December 1st on uh, Discovery. And um, I know there have been some talks of, you know, further distribution beyond that. But, you know, I think when it comes to the, the viewership and the audience, just to sort of go back for a second to the, the previous couple of answers, I think, you know, it was super important for us to get uh, folks on both sides to tell a story that is truthful and that people can say, oh, well, we can tell like it's not super lopsided. Um, but if I could make a story about this family portrait of a, of a tragedy and an injustice, um, and I had the choice between that or telling a story with, you know, big names like Brian Stevenson and, um, you know, the prosecutor and the judge and uh, the defense attorney and all those folks, I would definitely pick the side of the portrait because, um, you know, the, the first line, well, Ron, you don't know this, but the first line, uh, really one of the first ones in the movie that you say is, if it can happen to us, it can happen to anyone. And that's really, you know, the message that we're trying to get across here is that this is just anyone's story. Um, and that was just really important to us. So we're, we're hoping that people can sort of see their own families uh, reflected in this story and, and really take it to heart when they think about the criminal justice system and, and what we do to our, our children. Well, I think you guys succeeded leaps and bounds above any expectations because, yeah, I agree. The character portrait is what's going to make people remember, touch the heart. It won't just be salacious headlines. It won't just be facts and data. It, like, and you guys just being so open, um, Sue and Ron, it was an extremely powerful and touching movie. I hope you are able to watch it someday. Um, I totally understand that you haven't decided to view it yet, but I just can't thank you enough. Uh, for participating in this because you're going to change lives well um yeah. it's been our as as obviously you know when you do something like this you kind of think of yourself first but then look this should not happen to anybody i would not want this to happen to anybody and once again as everyone has said as i've told my friends and my friends if this can happen to us it's been then it can happen to anybody. No one would, no one thought about that. No one ever thinks about that, right? Your parents don't explain this to you. You know, they explain other things about life. They never, who would ever expect it? And it happened. And uh, we're perfect. Unfortunately, the example, not the example, the, the what am I trying to say? the story i mean you know again it happened to us um i it's just still very very difficult to answer your prior question when ron was speaking it doesn't get much easier for me it really doesn't um i um i have to what i try to do is is find distraction to help me through the day and that's really the only way I can handle the day. I hope 
like your strength though shows through it no matter well, if you're just knitting or crocheting and like it's yeah, right but i also know and i also feel that um we're, we we have to be here to help that and that's it there's no other question about that and that keeps you going he deserves it uh he's a he's a he's a great kid everyone says that about their kids but he is a good kid and if we're not here to help him who's going to be and that's something that uh, ron and i uh, want to speak to ron take very very seriously well i think you're surrounded by a great team that was uh able to spend so many years with you guys to really learn your real story and I just want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. It's so exciting to be able to present this to the world. Uh, thank you to all the audience out there. Uh, is there any kind of way um, people watching this? Because they can watch it for the rest of the festival. We'll keep it on our YouTube for months and years to come. Is there any kind of way to contact you guys about further information, about spreading the word about the film? Yeah, it's pretty easily found online. We've got a Facebook, um, we've got a, a website. Um, easy enough to reach out via the contact page there. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's no no end. The story's not over, really. Um, It'll never be over. Yeah, I mean, I think when something happens like this to the median, then you know that the issue is systemic. Um, and it's important for that point, like Dave was saying, the, the macrocosmic sort of ramifications of the story to be transmitted um, in it, through the human story to other people. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we're, there's still things to talk about. Uh, it's not over. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be really interesting and uh, compelling to see how things move forward. Um, there's a lot left to work on in terms of criminal justice reform and uh, this should hopefully be a seed. If I may ask, if I'm being heard, um, what is that website for everyone's that's benefit? That's great. I actually don't have the URL offhand, but I will get it in a moment. I'm pretty sure it's just the Whitmans.com. I think it's the Whitmans.com. Um, yeah. And we also have WhitmanProject at gmail.com if you want to just contact us directly. Correct. That's right. Yeah, and we're always here to be a platform for you guys to share your continuing story. But uh, thank you again, and uh, thank you to everyone watching and who we're going to be watching this conversation down the road. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you guys for having us. Everybody vote. Vote for Good compassion. Night. Vote for reform. Well